Would you like to introduce yourself first? Hi, I'm Roger. I'm a German geoscience student in the University of Tübingen. So I'm from southern Germany. I did my bachelor thesis on uh, the petrology of silica under saturated rock in the Black Forest. So nephilinites uh, and belelitites, and we'll cover that today, I, I hope. And my work group also um, studied the carbonatites of the Kaiserstuhl volcanic complex. So we talk a bit about that because I sent those samples uh, to Rocket Sage. And uh, yeah, pretty interesting stuff. That's it. So, <laughs> what brought you down the path of studying carbonatites? Because they are fairly specific. They're fairly specific volcanic rock type. Yeah. So, as I said, my bachelor thesis was on silica unsaturated rocks, not carbonatites. Carbonatites are just a, a special interest of mine because my work group in the university they um, also extensively study them. Uh, and yeah, they are very specific rocks. They are very weird. They weren't recognized until the uh, 60s, I believe. Oh, really? Yeah. I so mean, it's almost the same time that plate tectonics were realized that they understand that carbonatites were a separate separate type of rock. Oh, awesome. Or that, that they were volcanic. Of oh, volcanic that they were volcanic. Origin. Yeah. Because origin. when we think of carbonates, we think of... I mean, sedimentary limestone. rocks. Yeah, limestone, uh, yep. marble, stuff like that. Maybe metamorphics because limestone metamorphosed to, to marble or, yeah, limestone. Yeah, exactly. Where do you think you might go after you finish this degree of yours? <clears throat> are you gonna? Are you planning on pursuing your PhD? Um, so I'm currently in my master's and it's a tough question. <laughs> I think I haven't figured it out completely yet. Um, but uh, I took an interest in the exploration of uh, all these um, uh, high-tech elements, which are very important for a sustainable future. Um, that's why I also had an internship in a, a small firm, um, which um, does geophysical exploration of exactly these types of rocks. How long was that internship? It was about six weeks. Okay, it so was six weeks specifically long. looking at carbonatites in Germany? Uh, yes, it was also around the Kaiserstuhl uh, area. Uh, I did some field work on my own um, as well. So this okay. is the field area. Exactly. So first of all, where are we? We are in Central Europe and Germany, to be exact, or the south, southern half of Germany. And yeah, I... Um, show where we are focusing uh, on, where all your samples are, basically. That's a bit, yeah, you can go next, we can zoom in. So that's a rough geologic overview. You have uh, the upper Rhinegraben uh, filled with Cenozoic sediments, uh, as well as the Alpine front, uh, the Alpine foreland, excuse me. Um, so all younger sediments and then in in the middle, it, everything else is covered in Mesozoic sediments in yeah. blue. So Jurassic and Triassic sediments mostly. Cretaceous sediments are mostly up in, in uh, up in northern Germany because the whole area was uplifted during uh, the Alpine collision, the Alpine orogeny, and eroded down. And yeah, you spotted the yeah <laughs> the, the rise impact crater. crater. We talked about that before. I love yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so I let that in. And yeah, all the crystalline basement and folded Paleozoic rocks, rocks which, which are also sediments and um, meta sediments. Um, yeah, it, it's a rough overview. And on top of all those rocks are the Cenozoic igneous rocks, which also implicates that they are much younger than the surrounding uh, landscape. And they are also mostly um, of Miocenic age, and only some are also quaternary in, in age. Oh, that's really young. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so mostly, mostly um, moderate aged uh, volcanic regions, and some still dormant, like the Eiffel. And yeah, that's that's our first stop. That's the Kaiserstuhl volcanic complex and the southern part of the Upper Rhinegraben. 
Kaiser, wait, Kaiser, Kaiser Stuhl. Kaiser Stuhl, yes. Kaiser Stuhl. Exactly. Kaiser Stuhl Volcanic Complex. <laughs> Say it with me, chat. Kaiser Stuhl Volcanic Complex. Is that the, is that the horrible Emperor for you to Jail, hear? Basically, the Emperor Chair. The, the I'm sorry. The Emperor Chair. chair. Oh, the chair okay. of the Emperor. Of the, of the of the king. <laughs> the Emperor's chair. Yeah. That's what that uh, means. Because, yeah, that's what it means. Uh, oh. It also looks like a horseshoe, kind of, and or like a throne. So yeah. <laughs> that's where the name uh, comes from. That's really cool. So yeah. then we're looking in on this specific locale here. Yes. The Kaiser Stuhl. Um, oh Kaiser my Stuhl. <laughs> Kaiser Stuhl. Oh, okay. I'll do it someday. It, it's fine. It's fine. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, first we can see that it's uh, cut by uh, a fault, the Tuneberg fault, um, which uplifted uh, at the right side of the area, which is covered in... Um, Cenozoic uh, limestone. I think of Eocene age, but that's not that important right now. Then you have a uh, big area covered in uh, tephrite. Um, so um, alkaline rich silica okay. unsaturated uh, rock. So we are going in that direction <laughs> already. And at the very center, you have the carbonatite complex. Oh, I love it. And that's in and part C. Yeah, in part C, you can see a reconstruction how this whole thing probably looked. Before and it was destroyed? Yeah, because before it was eroded and cut by the, by the big fold and, and shifted downwards, uh, like you and see. And this, uh, this dashed line here is a giant fault here, right? Yes, because uh, the upper Rheingraben was an extensive uh, feature in okay. the Oligocene. So extension uh, was happening in the Oligocene. Yes. And it later transformed to a strike slip um, fault. Do you know why? That's actually uh, something yes. I don't know. Yes, because um, maybe we can go back to sure. two, yes, two faults. Uh, no, three, three to the big overview. Um, yeah, you can don't see it that much, but in the southern part, you can see the Alpine, Alpine front, the Alpine mountains. Mm -hmm. Switzerland and Austria uh -huh. and the uh, east side connected first to mainland Europe and pushed the whole uh, region to the north. So you had a roughly south-north um, compression that's cool. and that's where the upper Rhine graben uh, is also aligned to. Okay. And if you have compression you have also extension to uh, west and east. Mm -hmm. um, so this this happened in the Eocene you, you, and you Oligocene. You have compression that is pushing to the north south, which is causing extension east west. Does that make sense? Exactly. If I if I ever reiterate something, it's just because I I try to make make more sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so good to go back a little. Um, so the uh, western part of the Alpine Front connected first to mainland Europe. So we, we had a north south uh, compression and east-west extension mm -hmm. so the crust broke apart and then later the um, east side connected and shifted the whole stress field to a roughly um, north uh, northwest southeast direction okay and now you have extensive uh, extensive features uh, in cologne where the, the bedrock broken up and formed a new rift so, okay, that's right um, here. Yeah, that's right here. It's not that much developed yet, um, but we'll see how it goes. So there's Probably some we'll, baby we'll rifting happening here, some very, very young rifting? Um, relatively young, yes. Uh, it's it's uh, passive rifting, I think it's called, okay. um, instead of active rifting, where you have uh, the mantle pushing up and mm -hmm. actively driving the crust apart. Um, well, I think this could also be a bit outdated. <laughs> we, uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about, I mean, I don't know much about the geology or the structural geology of Germany and we could go over that again too, but it is interesting that there is some rifting happening here now. It's presumed to be passive. So there's not that mantle upwelling driving it. 
we can get exactly. into that another time. But does anybody have any questions regarding that currently? Did we get an overview of German geologic features earlier? No, we are just basically jumping into some of these rock types, and we're mostly going to be talking about carbonatites, a specific kind of magma that has carbonates in them, very, very rich with <clears throat> carbonate. And it's a, it's a group of minerals that end in the chemical formula CO3, or CO, CaCO3, yeah, CO3. Yeah. And um, they can be bonded with a variety of cations like calcium, magnesium, and calcium, um, manganese, like rhodochrosite. I'm not saying rhodochrosite is necessarily in these specific rocks, but the carbonates end in the chemical formula CO3. So again, we, we have the upper Rhine graben, the Miocene, uh, Oligocene extensive rift, which is now filled by Cenozoic sediments. Um, we have the Alpine foreland also filled with uh, Cenozoic sediments um, from the Alpine uplifting and eroded sediments. Then you have um, uh, Mesozoic uh, sediments, uh, limestone, sandstone, um, covering in between the uplifted areas. The uplifted areas you can spot as the crystalline basement and folded Paleozoic rocks. So yeah, that green are the here. deepest rocks, which were brought to the surface um, by the Alpine orogeny because it pushed to the mainlands of Europe and it uplifted a whole bunch of uh, of land. And for those of you who don't know, an orogeny is a mountain building event. It's it's the thing that makes mountains. Oh yeah, right. So we're la looking at the Kais Kaiserstuhl volcano yes. complex. I did Very it. good. I, I said it right. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, yeah. So we stopped at the carbonatite complex in the center. And in B, it's a bit more detailed. You see the Badberg, the Hasselschacher Burg, Degenmatt, and Orberg. You don't have to pronounce these. These are not important. It's fine if I, I can say them. Yes. Um, I won't be able to pronounce half of these words. I'm German, <laughs> but I can't speak it. Uh, Badberg is, for like, is uh, maybe the, the easiest to, to pronounce. Sorry slipped into German there. Yeah, so and tell you... us first about part A here. We've got a fault oh, yeah. here, right? Exactly. Yeah, the Tuneberg fault. It's it's the one Tuna, of the... Tuneberg, yeah. Tuneberg. Tu it's Tun Tuneberg written, fault. Written very small. Yeah, it's the... right there. I see it. It's on its side. Tuneberg. Exactly. Um, yeah, so it's a normal fault. Uh, so the left side of the complex is shifted down, like we see in, in the lower right part of the reconstruction. So this normal faulting means that there's extension happening such that one of the sides is going to basically drop alongside the other as a response of that extension. Exactly. And there's a little lake here? Uh, no, no, the gray part is the carbonate. Oh, complete. yeah, you're right. You're, uh, you're right. It, I don't know why I thought that was a lake. It's uh, B. So I didn't there... notice that there was phonolite. Is that associated with carbonatites? Yeah, phonolite is, well, it's part of the the um, rock series, which are also associated with carbonatites and other, under, other silica undersaturated rocks. So we have a lot of uh, silica more... undersaturated rocks in the middle here, and then a lot of explosive stuff surrounding it, the tephra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or the tephritic rocks. Tef tephritic. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's, it's not tephra, it's tephrite. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. it, there's a difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One, uh, one is the product of a uh, volcanic eruption, which uh, is deposited again, and the other is, is a volcanic rock. Yes. Uh, but Absolutely, we can... yes. I, I have uh, the QAPF diagram later on, so we can look where... Good, I was actually hopeful that you... Yeah, perfect. perfect. <laughs> it's, it's in the next uh, lecture, okay. unfortunately. That's okay. Um, the QAPF diagram is the one in which geologists uses... They use to identify specifically the type of igneous rocks they're dealing with. The top, there's basically two triangles. They're attached. It'll look like a diamond. The top deals with silica-rich igneous rocks. The bottom deals with silica-poor. So white velcro as silica undersaturated. Does that mean they come from lower in the crust? That's a great question. Do you want to answer that, Virgil? Yeah, we can go straight into that. So most of these rocks are um, mental melts. So they don't come from the crust. They come from the mantle, like all melts, but they don't stop necessarily in the crust. Um, 
the phonolites do because they're a bit more evolved. So you have a very um, mafic composition of a mental melt. Uh, so um, magnesium iron rich um, and relative silica saturated, unsaturated basaltic composition. Um, and it gets stuck in a crust and it evolves further and it can go into a silica oversaturated direction like um, andesite, uh, no. like rhyolite, granite, stuff like that um, with may maybe crustal contamination um, or it can go in the other direction, depends on, on the initial um, uh, composition, I guess. It, it's not really my uh, specialty. <laughs> But you know oh, a lot, oh, that, nonetheless. Yeah. Nonetheless. And, but phonolites are still uh, felsic rocks like rhyolite because they don't have many mafic minerals, so dark minerals in them. So if you have one sample in your hand, wait, I think I have one here. Yeah. Of the phonolite? I don't think I have a sample. So not, not from that area, but this is from Mount Pektu um, in North Korea. The sample was Korea, also yeah. sent to me by... Oh, that's uh, awesome. Who sent that? Kyla Yakovino. Oh my gosh, that's right. She's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was from the first rock exchange. <laughs> that's amazing. Did. I forgot about yeah, that. It was, it was really great. So yeah, I can show it again. So it, mm -hmm. it's phonolite. It's uh, oh, gray, look at gray, those gray, nice gray. coarse crystalline. Yeah. So nothing really dark like um, this type of rock. Oh yeah, the nephilim. Very, very mafic. Um, yeah. The, there was the only time I've ever seen phonolites in person was at, well, that I know of, that what I was looking for was at Devil's Tower in Wyoming. It's, it's all yeah. phonolite. It's a giant tower of phonolite. And of course you can't it, take samples because it's a national park, so don't do it. Uh, not even, uh, stuff laying on the ground. <laughs> no, you can't take anything. Uh. Not sticks, not stones, none of it. Nothing. And it was also an intrusion. Or how did oh. it form? Do you know that? The, which one? The um, Devil's, Devil's, Devil's Tower. Yeah, it was, they think it was a lacolith or a ancient volcanic neck. Um, there's four main theories. I don't think that they've picked one yet. Okay. But it is uh, basically an igneous, um, intrusive igneous rock that is that was exposed later due to weathering and erosion that exposed that particular feature such that it looks like a tower today. And we have a similar feature here too, a lot smaller though, um, but we get to it later. Sure. Where are we? Phonolites. Yeah, they are, they are also intrusive parts of the uh, complex. Also so we... just, just a few fingers if you like. So you can see it as, as a few spots. It's not the main yeah. body. No, it's not. Just those yellow spots here are the phonolites that we've been talking about. Carbonatites in the middle, the tephritic rocks surrounding that. I see that there's sodalite Monzo Gabros. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Um, uh, yeah, if you don't want to, we can talk about that another time. Um, yeah, maybe. maybe we, can, I... we can move on from that another time. Well, well I, just, I just saw that. I'm like, ooh. I know that we'll talk a little bit about the olivine nep nephilinites as well. Uh, but let's move on yeah. from part A, unless you've got anything else you'd like to say? Um, not much. Maybe just going back to the Tuneberg fault real quick, you can see it also yep. in picture B. Yep. Uh, so one, yeah. And this it separates the orb. Oh, it does. There's from... two segments. Yeah, it, it's more complicated, but the main mm -hmm. Tuneberg fault is the, on the right. Uh, it separates the Orberg on the right uh, from, from the Bartberg complex on the, on the left. Um, that's, that's a bit important because your sample is from the Orberg and oh, up I, here. I see. I see. I was like, where is that? Okay. So yeah. the Orberg, oh, oh, yeah. so the carbonatite that I'm looking at, that's where that is from. Exactly. Okay. That's, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> and is it, oh, it's, it's not geo referenced. Sorry about that. <laughs> So, by the way, I would like to mention that this rock is about 17.2 million years old. Yeah, that's what you yeah, have written six, down. No, 16. Maybe you have the wrong tag. Or, or I they up. all say 17.2. Oh, 17. So, oh. All of oh, the seven. carbonatites say 17.2. Oh, uh, I, I heard uh, 7. Sorry. No, no, uh, no. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, it it's uh, so, yeah, it, it checks out. I think yeah, the national lights are maybe the sixteen. Yeah, no, that one's different. Um, the all of the national lights is... is is a bit tricky sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, oh. So, uh, oh gosh, I want to now. I I want to know about radiometrically dating carbonatites and how difficult that is. But we can move on. Let's move on. That's going to be another question for another time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so one uh, quick, uh, one, more, one more note. Um, so um, the Orberg is uh, right here. Uh, numbered as number one in C. And you can see it was one of the deepest parts of the complex, exactly. And right it didn't here. reach the surface. That's important for the next part. So this piece here that's now exposed, when it was erupting, didn't actually breach the surface. Exactly. It wasn't erupting. It's and it's also an intrusive uh, feature. Yeah. I really like this here because you can see what happened when it was erupting, right? This is what this figure yeah. C is showing at the very top. And then here you see where it is today. Exactly. It's yeah. a very great figure. It is beautiful. And you can see all the faults here, these normal faults one after another. Or no, those are, yeah, they are, they are. And one, two, three, and four, of course, correlate with one, two, three, and four here. Just in case you missed that, I'm not sure what the quality looks like for you on your on your end, but that is what this diagram is showing. But this is just a beautiful diagram. Um, ah, yes, White Velcro, Kaiserstuhl does mean king's chair, yes, or emperor chair. Yeah, I think somebody said Ca the, the Caesar's chair, but I think emperor is what you initially said, emperor's chair. Yeah, I mean, Caesar chair also checks out. It's just a Roman name. Okay. The czar's chair with that. <laughs> kidding. How I'm old kidding. can carbonatites get? Uh, very old. We have carbonatites re um, ranging from billions of years old to today's years old. <laughs> so they're, they're not uh, restrained to a specific time area like uh, kimberlites are. Mm. Uh, kimberlites, you may know from uh, town of Kimberley, the diamond mine, and those are mainly Cretaceous age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's not very specific circumstances and carbonatites um, can put, uh, can get produced all the time. In fact, there's, there's a, there's, yeah, there's several in production today. They're not nearly as many as other types of volcanic activity, but I think there's what, 46 active carbonatite volcanic areas on globally. I read in one of the papers, it was something around that number, but only 13 of them produce eruptions that are um effusive oh you mean uh, ah, yes um well we have one active carbonatite volcano today which is all during your in yep. africa uh, in the east african rift and um but what you mentioned was uh extrusive yes. carbonatites unlike They're... your first sample yeah Oh, they may not all be active. No, no, over over time, which we know. And this and only fourteen of them had lava flows. Exactly. So we don't have many carbonatite lava flows. Mm -mm. But we'll get to those. Okay. So this is just another quick overview uh, of the classification of carbonatites, uh, with uh, depending on their calcium, magnesium, and iron content. So just to give you um, a little bit of introduction to what this is. This is what's called a ternary diagram. Yes, it is a triangle, but we call them ternary diagrams in geology. And on one end, you've got calcium and oxygen, right? So that's the calcium end member, the magnesium end member, and then the iron and magnesium end members here. Exactly. And then depending on what content that rock has, it could land anywhere in this triangle. But first, something to be classified as a carbonatite, it has to have at least 50% uh, uh, um, uh, carbonate. Mm -hmm. That's C. Any carbonate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's CO3. That's yeah. the end number, CO3. And Sorry. most carbonatites are calcium carbonatites. There are a few dolomite uh, hosting carbonatites uh, called B4 sites, but. Hmm. I think none of them are really primary. They're mostly a uh, secondary feature, so uh, hydrothermal alteration and yeah. stuff like that. 
Uh, and the carbonatite from Aldungio Lengai, the only active uh, carbonatite volcano is uh, sodium, <laughs> sodium uh, carbonatite, which is also something entirely different. And we have almost no work record of atrium carbonatites because the stuff also gets uh, weathered and altered yes. very quickly. It's very yeah, reactive. It um, sodium, at least from what I understand from my own practices, sodium calcium oftentimes if they're changed in a variety of ways that can be yeah. quite interesting yeah, and then you can um, divide the calcium carbonate more if you have a coarse grained sample it's called a servite so yes um, the that plutonic is here. variant you can and see how big it... those crystals are you can see them with the naked eye yeah and it's very unusual for a carbonatite, correct? You don't often get plutonic ones, generally. Quite the opposite. You mostly get plutonic oh, ones. Oh, that's right. See, carbonatites yeah. are not my area of expertise. It's his. <laughs> so I'm sorry if I mistake, but the larger and coarse-grained ones, such that you can see those crystals with your naked eye, are the less common types. The more common types are going to be the ones that I'll show you later. We have to stay... Uh... The plutonic ones survive for us to to study. Yeah, actually, <laughs> a lot of the <laughs> yeah, I think that's the big difference. Yeah, um, yeah, and the medium to fine grained are called uh, alkyvite, and I have also some here. They are not as uh, special. Oh. They also have this yellowish surface yeah. weathering. Yeah, they do. So I'm wondering if there's any iron content in here, such that they're oxidizing in that way on the surface. Uh, yes, I have. Let me see if I have my magnets somewhere. Uh, weekly, weekly. Um, magnetic. Magnetic. I may need another sample. Uh, if you have one, you can try it yourself. I think your sample should be magnetic. This one here? I can check with mine as well. It, it, it's hard to show. Uh, on stream, but yeah, the, it, it's it's uh, it's also magnetic. Yeah, and that is the is that the phonolite? That's not a phonolite. No, no, that's that's a carbonatite. Also. Okay, that is the carbonatite. So like the sample you have, it, it's it's hard to show uh, on stream. <laughs> yeah, it's hard it's to it's hard weekly. to see. I'd love to see. Do you have any way to take pictures of these things? Oh wait, oh wait, here, here we go. Okay. Oh! snap okay so this this has a lot of magnetism. that's a lot of magnetism <laughs> that's pretty impressive and that's what that's the same sample that i'm looking at the same outcrop yes yes damn that's cool okay Glad that so what out. mineral in there is is causing the magnetism is it magnetite i can go to the next slide to see that perfect okay so this is a close-up uh, for one of my samples um, so yeah, you have uh, iron titanium oxides, yep, um, or magnetite with titanium. Um, you can you see it on on the lower lower left mm -hmm. and sprinkled throughout the carbonatite. There's there there, and then there's the py pyrochlor. Yeah, pyrochlor is um, another oxide which is. Uh, uh, a neop, uh, neop titanium oxide, I believe. Yeah, uh, which uh, and it can also hold um, rare earth elements such as uh, CO. So CE. Looks like this. There are very, different very types big. of pyrochlors. It's um, a, a whole another mineral group. <laughs> Yeah, it's huge. They didn't I've... specify here. It's a huge mineral group. That's crazy. I'm I'm not sure if you have some good uh, pyrochlor crystals in your sample. You have you have to look or maybe break it apart a bit more. I can break it. That's allowed. It's it's your sample now. I, have, I don't want I have to smash more. it. I feel so bad. <laughs> but I do want to see more fresh surfaces. I won't lie. I can send you another one if you like. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I'm just gonna smash everything. We'll just have a smash stream segment. Sage smash! <laughs> oh, this can For get science. very messy. <laughs> yeah, and, and other minerals, flogopite, exactly, and apatite as well. I have one big sample of flogopite. May I show it? Yes. It's gigantic. 
What if you just said, no, you are not allowed to show it? <laughs> <laughs> it's translucent also. It's transparent. You can just see right through it. I can. I don't know if the Brio will show you that. It's just a giant piece of Flogopite. It's a mica. Look at that. It's all it's all flexible. So it's pretty neat. I like this piece a lot. It's really enormous. It is so big. It's <laughs> This this was one of, I think this was a birthday gift last year. <laughs> it's just beautiful. Um, did you do you find any pieces of flogopite in your samples that you can identify with the with the eye? It's usually uh, micas are pretty pretty clear. Carbonatite in the carbonatite sample. Yeah. Uh, in some yes. Um, it depends if they are contaminated with uh, other silicate rocks because Fair. they only have. Um, I think less than one rate percent uh, silica oxide in them. Okay. So it's very hard to form uh, silica minerals. And now, yeah, the Orberg samples shouldn't have plogopite in them, but uh, other other pieces can from from other areas from the complex because they interacted more with the silica. Um, Rocks like um, the like Nausea and Cyanids, for example, and that's also um, um, important for the next part. Oh, I oh, do have a quick important. question based off somebody in chat before we move on. Does oh, yeah? does pyrochlor ever occur in large chunks? Um, do you happen to know? And see, I just want to say that minerals, depending on their environment, can very wildly and some things depending on their chemical composition won't get that big to begin with but i don't know about pyrochlor do you so if you mean large chunks like large minerals um, yeah large not, pieces of mineral not, in the rock and yeah, not not in the kaiserstuhl volcanic complex i don't know from other areas but i think they are generally pretty pretty normal sized for minerals like millimeter size and millimeter size okay so, so uh, probably one more, not in these environments one more interesting fact about this uh, about the orbic is that it was once a uh, neop mine uh during the second world war for, for, what? for all the yeah for all the steel production that's awesome you need that's a NIOP to to strengthen it that's really interesting so this this particular area was used for that yes Oh, Orbeck. wow. It's also an open query. That's because uh, you can go there and look at the outcrop. We can see a picture of it later on. Anybody and... can just go? Yeah. Yeah, you can go. So how how many quarries are just open like that in Germany? Um, many. <laughs> so you can just go without having to get permission? Uh, old old ones, maybe. Um, some other ones are closed for the public because they are not taken care of. So it's dangerous to go in there. But I mean, um, it's a bit dangerous because of rockfall and stuff like that. Uh, we didn't mine that much um, dangerous material. We don't have dangerous um, mine tailings, stuff like that. I think you mentioned it yesterday in our call. Mm -hmm. um, um, but usually, if, if they are still somewhat active, you can ask. This one That's is fair. in also in uh, protected land, basically. Um, like a, not not like... a natural park necessarily, because people still live there, but it's uh, somewhat protected. But you can still go around and uh, yeah, see all the you... stuff. And it's oh, okay yeah, if, if you can take like a walk from, from the grass or so. That's really... That, that's a problem. That's wow. That's really interesting. A lot of the uh, mines and quarries here are oftentimes closed off for safety purposes, but there's some you can get permission to get into, depending, depending, which is what it's I'm trying to do. Alone. Yes, but to alone to this. don't go alone in, into old quarries. That's never a good idea. I love the uh, uh, the Zelda reference. It's cute. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, I think I did you. I think you sent me this SEM picture. Before. Yes, it's it's one of the um, papers I sent you to read. Yes, <laughs> that's where I've seen it. It's just beautiful. I love. I'm obsessed with SEM pictures. You know, for no real reason. 
at all. I don't know why. <laughs> I can see so much. Uh, quick explanation. So the dark areas are uh, areas with lighter elements, and the heavier ones are. Ele oh, we're talking uh, about F specifically, right? Yeah, with okay. heavy, heavier elements. So rare earth elements, uh, uranium, tantalum, all the stuff on on the right hand side. That's awesome. So this specifically again for your sample, the Orberg uh, query, and the pyroclos are the source of of the elements uh, you want, you want to mine, also for other areas. And here you can see um, they are not really zoned. Other pyroclos from other uh, um, um, locations have a very clear zoning, maybe with. Uh, um, and core, which was surrounded by newer pyrochlor, and the core came from another um, a rock uh, and was taken up by the carbonatite. And this one does not show anything. It shows uh, alteration from the outside, as you can see, like the, this cloudy structure. This and is a beautiful image. Yeah, E is a regular. Um, from a petro uh, petrographic microscope. It's cross polarized. Uh, no, no, I think. Not. Really? Oh wow, I thought this was cross polarized, but I'm I, you took this image, not me. No, no, I don't, didn't take it. Um, it looks Benjamin cross polarized because <laughs> of the birefringence I'm seeing on the on the tal side. Otherwise, it would typically be kind of clear. In the um, I f but I think pure claw is. I think it's cubic. Don't quote me on that, and therefore it would be um, isometric. Black, but... Or yeah, isotropic. Yeah, isotropic. That might be. Uh, but uh, but I'm not sure at the moment. <laughs> it could okay. be. Uh, by I, I have to find out. I'm so curious. I think you're by right though, because the pyro the pyrochlor looked isometric in the images. Yeah, I mean, main um, by Fingen's colors of cards are really freaky and. You, can't necessarily tell if it's cross uh, polars or not. Yeah, calcite's a bit a bit obnoxious in that way. Yeah, I mean, really pretty, but um, yeah, it's it, it easy to identify. It's easy to identify, yes. Uh, yeah, and yeah, th those those bright parts all are enriched in rare earth elements. You can see uh, on the on the right hand side up to eighteen point four red percent. Ah, uranium oxide. Yeah, like also uranium, percent. also thorium, and that's also a problem if you want to mine it, because then you have to deal with all the radioactive. Is my rock radioactive? Mm. Am I gonna die? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Probably, maybe a bit more than than granite or something like that. That's fine. No, I know that it's that's just how rocks are. There's always gonna be some basic yeah. or or background radioactivity one in the atmosphere and two in a lot of the rock samples just because of. Uh, potassium is radioactive, for example, and it's in all of the micas, basically. And it's micas are in every rock, so <laughs> that alone it, is radioactive. In this one. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and, and then not it, to mention the radium. It's very Mediterranean climate there as well, so I think that's cancel out mm -hmm. the uh, radioactive uh, decay. <laughs> that's funny. It's a med Mediterranean climate here too. Where, I, where I'm currently at. Yeah, I mean, the south one, uh, Upper Weingram, is uh, one of the sunniest parts of Germany. I think, what is it, 2,000 sunshine hours per year or something like this. I don't know. That's crazy. In northern Germany, you have barely 1,000. I like so, that yeah. there's zirconium oxide, too. I mean, that makes yeah. sense, especially if there's uranium oxide. Those cations are the same size. They're going to swap for one another and be very abundant. This is really interesting. I just love SEM and, and I love petrography and I love scanning electron microscopy. Yeah. I've done a lot of it. I didn't do it on uh, igneous petrology. I did it on sedimentary petrology. So this is completely different, especially because it's a carbonatite. Yeah. And again, oh, so you, you can see why it's a carbonatite is uh, so wanted as a, as a source for rare earth elements, which mm -hmm. are uh, needed for a, a lot of technology. Of, yes. <laughs> All yes. the modern stuff. Scaffolding. Do you ever build scaffolding or whatever other sort of safety structure while going into a cave or crevice? Oh, absolutely. I mean, have you ever had to construct your own 
safety measurements upon spelunking or going caving rather? Well, I going don't go mines. caving really. <laughs> I've never gone into caves that I've had to personally do that to build scaffolding or any kind of protection, but I also don't go into caves that are off limits. Yeah. Um, and then he's talking about a quarry, right? That you went into that wasn't, it was an open pit quarry. It's an open pit, yes. Yeah, you still have the sun above your head. <laughs> yeah. And and I mean, do you wear a helmet or anything? What do you do for protection yes. in those? Yes, yeah. always handled, always um, uh, like like um, yellow vests mm -hmm. that people can see you. Yes, that's actually really down. important. I'm not going to lie. They're not attractive. I know, but wear them. They're for your yes. protection. Also, goggles, goggles if you want to hit rocks. <laughs> Very yes. important. Buy goggles. We always wear goggles. Proper geologists always forever. We only have goggles also every day. Yeah, okay, so now we can go to the exclusive uh, mm -hmm. carbonatite, your carbonatite llama. Will you, do you want to show it on stream? Yes, so I've got, let me show you. So this is the coarse-grained carbonatite, the sovite that I've got. Let me show you. Let's see if I can get some really nice close-ups of this on better this is a really you can see how a phonetic how fine grained this is but at the same time you see a few of the uh, of the of the bigger crystals in here That's a weathered surface. That's a fresh surface. And then, did you want to show the lapilli one right now? Yes, you can show the lapilli with sample as well. So this is the one with lapilli. I think one of the pieces is right there. <clears throat> It's hard to see on streams, so you maybe have to feel it in real life. It is. It is. It's hard to see these. But some of the concentric pieces you can see were right there. You see that one? Yeah. Yeah, this area. Yeah. So an important uh, getaway from this uh, piece of information is that it shows that the carbonatite really erupted. It erupted into Miocene air in the atmosphere and made the made these pebbles, which fell back into the carbonatite lava as it um, flowed down down the flanks of the volcano. That is so neat. So these little pieces of lapilli, which are extrusive pieces from a volcano that get thrown out, got caught back in the lava flow. That is amazing. They're that very, really cool. they're very hard to see, but <clears> once <throat> you can see them, yeah, I can feel them better than I can see them. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. This one is my favorite. It was mine as well. That's why I sent it to you. Oh. Yeah, this one's my favorite. And so the other one just shows the. Uh, primary calcite crystals a bit better, but it has also a lot of secondary calcite, so I sent you two pieces. Look how weathered that is. I love this. These are actually little voids. They're little holes left where minerals were weathered out, preferentially. I think exactly. that is so cool. You just see how much more destroyed this one has been <laughs> because of surficial conditions. Look at that weathered surface. Oh boy. Oh yeah. That is think, a very weathered surface. I think I also just smashed the, the right one and the left I didn't because it has it had lapilli in it. Oh, this so, one did? Yeah, the left one, the, the reddit one. It smells like rock. It's hard to tell it's <laughs> two years ago already. 
This is a beautiful. I know they're rocks, but they're beautiful. <laughs> Hi, Zach. Sparkling. And that's enough. <laughs> it's all I have to do. Sparkle. Sparkle. I like that this one has the voids in it. This one doesn't even spark. Well, there's a couple of mineral faces in here if you really rotate it. Let's see. I found one here. There's one. There's a little mineral face. You can, I don't know if you'll be able to see it reflecting. You can't. It's so tiny. But there's a few little mineral faces in here you can reflect light off of. Yes, these are igneous. These are called carbonatites. I, I really love this one. I love when you can see the preferential weathering of various minerals. I don't know why it just excites me so much, but it does. <laughs> because different things are going to be more susceptible to the environment than others. And certain things are actually going to be more stable at higher conditions or higher temperature pressure conditions uh, deeper in the asthenosphere, which is really interesting. Anything else you want to say about these two? Um, not sure. We can look at the thin section pictures. We have a bit more information here. So no, these are called carbonatites. They're a different kind of rock, and they're ah. these two are extrusive <laughs> specifically. And he's they're about to go the over them. <laughs> oh yeah, they're very <laughs> silica water. poor because rhyolite has a lot of silica, whereas these do not really have much at all. You can say they are exotic igneous rocks. That yeah, they are exotic outside. igneous rocks. So what you're holding there is extrusive carbonatite lava. Um, which uh, which was erupted around yeah 7.2 million, million years ago, ago, give or take a few hundred thousand years, um, and it's one of roughly 50 locations in the world uh, of uh, with evidence of extrusive carbonatite lava, and most of them are pure clastic uh, deposits anyway. So you have um, uh, like uh, tephra and there you have a small pebble of carbonatite, um, primary carbonatite, which formed in the, in the mantle and got erupted to the surface. Um, but it's not really a carbonatite volcano, but you have a lot of other silicates melt in there. And what you have is uh, really fossil lava, uh, lava um, one of about 20 locations. Um, and we know that because uh, we looked uh, at fin sections like this and uh, can see what is primary calcite, what, what is secondary calcite. We have other primary igneous uh, minerals and they're like uh, nepheline, uh, nepheline, nepheline. Yeah, right here, nepheline. And also uh, pyrochlor minerals. Mm, um, yes. So, so these one also bear much more resemblance to the carbonatites from the Bartberg area. Uh, um, Which we have was seen it, it, yeah, here. Here, here. So we were just previously are... looking at the or Orberg area, correct? Yes. Okay. And so now we're switching the parts, and the Bartberg is more like the main vent from where this lava got erupted. And you, you can see it's the secondary calcite goes around the primary calcite and that's probably the the uh, sparkly stuff and and the unreddled sample you have mm -hmm. so, um, is the secondary calcite yeah yeah that the right rims in the in the cavities yeah that makes more sense and the uh, holes were probably primary calcite like this which got reddled out or maybe the maybe some nepheline which there's gets a lot also of um easily. Primary and secondary calcite also form in um, <clears throat> sedimentary environments. And we have to determine which is which, just in a very, very similar way. This is so awesome <laughs> to me. Anything yeah, else? I think it's, it's mostly done um, um, like, like on a microscope, so, so no chemical analysis. Yeah. You can get an idea of what the minerals are, but unless you chemically analyze them, you're only going to get an idea. Are these underwater when they erupted? No, no one I. Um, How are they carbonatite? They are carbonatites because they're more than 50% calcium carbonate, carbo, um, calcium carbonate. Yeah, exactly. Yep. They are, cal they, they, they are classified as such. Now, why is it that there are magmas with carbonates in them at all? One of the things I noticed is that the 
temperature of these magmas is much lower yeah. than silica-rich magmas. The other thing That's is, fine. why do they form in the first place? That's a good question. It's also um, stuff of ongoing research. So there's not really a solidified answer yet on that. Uh, it depends on uh, the locality, I guess. Um, Pun so... not intended. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, what important is the role, of course, of CO two mm -hmm. in in the melt um, uh, production uh, in the melt ge uh, generation. Uh, and CO two exists melt. in most melts as a gas anyway, as a volatile. Yeah, but it has to be um, much more abundant. Yeah, much more, it has to be oversaturated, and maybe you have even um, highly altered. Uh, uh, low, uh, upper mantle, maybe a little spare mantle from a subduction uh, event a few hundred million years back or something like this. Um, so you uh, alter the mantle above the subduction zone um, with, um, uh, with the fluids, with uh, water, um, with, with CO2, and maybe even um, uh, generate um, um, Car uh, carbonates in the mantle, like dolomite. Uh, dolomite is stable in mantle depth. And later, if you have an extension event with uh, low partial melting, um, which will only melt um, the most um, um, not unstable, but um, you have different parts of, of a mantle rock which rather goes in, into the melt and which some parts uh, which rather want to be want to stay a rock so uh, there's it's kind of like and, if you haven't bones reaction series or fractional crystallization are two ways in which we could explain that probably um basically different minerals melt at different temperatures depending on their chemical composition Is and that what, let's, yeah. yeah and let's say in a rift scenario the temperature stays the same only the pressure pressure changes um, so you only melt uh, some parts of the mantle, and that could be uh, very carbonate rich, mm -hmm. uh, very silica undersaturated because you don't melt olivine. You melt uh, parts of uh, pyroxene first, and pyroxene is also um, calcium and yes, natrium. Yes, calcium rich. Uh, sorry, sodium. <laughs> uh, switched into German again. So it's pyroxene is uh, calcium and sodium rich, yes. and uh, you melt this part first and what you're left with is a depleted mantle source which doesn't have uh, uh pyroxine but only autopyroxine which uh, is uh, mostly um, magnesium or iron rich that is these are very very interesting melts so somebody's asking what mineralization is it it means the formation of a mineral in a very specific setting <clears throat> um the hydrothermal deposition of economically important metals in the formation of ore bodies is one mineralization doesn't necessarily mean ore all of the time you can just have a mineral form it's mineralization it forms it grows and it can happen in igneous sedimentary and metamorphic environments it can happen from magma to a solid it can happen mm -hmm. in a solid state so without melting like in a metamorphic environment that's all it is it's just a mineral that forms and you can have fossils that are mineralized so that's some that's actually one of the ways in which mo fossils are preserved is through the process of mineralization so they can happen in a variety of environments we're just specifically talking about this one yeah no worries all right um yeah to to get back to a real world example so the uh europe was also part of many subduction zones over the last yes. few hundred years there are many old um fused uh zones of 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 crust uh only a few hundred kilometers apart um so you you have a lot of fluids brought down into the sub european little shared mantle this is just an uh, example of a generic subduction zone just so you can see uh i don't have the stream open ah yes perfect yeah i just grabbed a generic one and uh, I think um, geologic surveys also detected um, an anomaly uh, at 600 kilometers down 
um, so I was uh, in below the asthenosphere, asthenosphere lower mantle boundary, um, which is believed to be the old subducted uh, plates. But they don't reach um, all the way down to under every um, volcanic region in, in Central Europe, so it's not clear if, if this really plays a role. Um, but fact is the sub-European glitosphere mantle is um, altered by, uh, by fluids, um, which is called metasomatism. Mm. And now you have the alpine orogeny, the alpine um, mountain building event, uh, um, which causes rifting all over Europe and low, um, low partial melting of the of the mantle, which produces all these exotic igneous melts. Let's see, these are all fairly complex, but that's okay. I was just hoping to find a quick image of the alpine orogeny. That's really fairly complex for what we're doing, but that's okay. It's beautiful. This is just it, gorgeous. It's a rough explanation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you don't need a specific picture of the alpine orogeny. You just have to know that it happened and that you had uh, rifting all over Europe, like the Upper Rhine Graben. And I'm not sure if Kersutite is in the chat, uh, but uh, in, in France as well. And at the Czech German border called the Eger Graben and many more. I want to stare at this forever, but let's continue. <laughs> I just want to stare at that. I love okay. it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think you can go to the next slide. Um, there was another question from uh, Zagatek. So the metamorphism in the Alpine region make for more exotic magmas. Not necessarily. Um, metamorphism re uh, in relation to um, orogeny of mountain building events is uh, separate from uh, these exotic magmatism. Um, uh, it's connected due to uh, the generated stress field and the resulting rifting of the uh, European crust. And then um, you release these trapped uh, uh, on a thread, but then you generate uh, the, this slow partial melting in, in the lower mantle, uh, in the upper mantle. Extrusive carbonatite. So we just covered. A little yeah, bit yeah, unextrusive that, that's and then just the got... description again we, we covered okay. that so we can uh, quickly look at the outcrop pictures i took so on on the left you have the uh, orbach query <laughs> it's, that's, it's... The, that's the big crystalline stuff that we've got that's yeah the that's the derived um uh locality um yeah not nothing really special it's just a small query um it's special it... to me <laughs> I mean, it's it's uh, pretty good because it's the only open query uh, there from all the carbonatites. The other are covered in uh, in grass. Like, how many people can say they've got a chunk of carbonatite from Germany? Not very many. Not very many. Relative but... speaking, of course. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair, fair. All right, so we've got sovite here, and I can show you what that looks like again from that locale, and. Uh... So again, this is the from, this is the sovite from the quarry on the left, the image on the left. Exactly. And you can see just how again how coarse grain this is. That means you can see the various mineral crystals with the naked eye. And you can see the light reflecting <clears> off <throat> of each of their crystal faces independently of one another. This is again the, the fresh surface um, and the weathered surface. So this is the one that was exposed to most of the elements. And then this is what the fresh surface looks like when you break it, when you break it open. Uh, oh, wow. I don't know if you can see this. I can right see here. the, I can, I can see the <laughs> minerals. Oh, wow. Those are really coarse grained. 
Some of those look like about a centimeter in size. Uh, not not really. They're mostly millimeter sized. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah. And on the right right hand side, you can see the locality of the carbonatite lava, which isn't really special. <laughs> Hey, we did look at it, and some of it sparkled. And the other had lapilli in it. It is special. No, no, no. I mean the locality, not not the oh. samples. Samples are, are very those, special. Are those grapes? Are the, yeah. Is that a vineyard? Oh. It, it's a vineyard, yeah. Uh, on the very right-hand side, just uh, behind the trees, there is um, the phonolite, uh, phonolite query. It goes very deep down, <laughs> so I have to be careful. And you're standing practically on the old flank of the Kaiserstuhl volcano, which was, of course, a really big volcano. Today, you just see the remnants, but it was maybe two or three kilometers high or something like this um, in the midst of, of this big uh, Rhine Valley. So It's just so funny to think that nobody actually has any idea what that vineyard's on. One of the I most mean, rare. Oh, really? They, no, it stands on volcanic rocks. Maybe, well, maybe yeah. not carbonatite lava flow because, yeah, there are very small areas. There's another one, but this one is is the better one, and the lava flow is just maybe a meter, half a meter uh, thick, because carbonatite lava is really low viscosity. Mm-hmm. It, it Despite its low water. temperature, that just I thought that was very, very cool. Uh, yeah, viscosity it has a low temperature, this... but it also has very, very little silica. Yeah. And so the minerals aren't uh, bound together. They don't yes. stick together due to yes. the silica. So viscosity has to do with how thick or thin a, a liquid is, how sticky it, it flows. So <laughs> something like water versus syrup have very different viscosities. Um, uh, the stickier something is, the thicker it is, the higher in viscosity it is. Right, the lower the viscosity something is, the more likely it's going to flow very easily in a fluid manner, mm-hmm. like a basalt might. So in this case, it's very strange because it's it's got a it's very very low temperature, but it's got a high viscosity. No, 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 a low viscosity, low, right? Low viscosity, very low. And and it it's got a low viscosity because it doesn't have a lot of silica in it. And silica in the presence of magma tend to bind together and polymerize and make things a little more sluggish and sticky. Which is why mm-hmm. silica-rich volcanics produce very, very explosive eruptions, whereas carbonatites are extremely different and rare. <laughs> not to mention, areas. not to mention, very, very rare. There is a river nearby. Uh, Event Testa. It's the Rhine River. <laughs> From so, this position, I think you can see it in the distance, maybe. I I don't know if I can. Personally. Not not really, but you have to imagine it somewhere. I'm there. imagining <laughs> a big river. Yeah, the it's... other side, you, maybe you can see the mountains. That's that's from. I can, I can see the mountains. Yeah. The um. So how, what is if you had to compare the viscosity of a carbonatite lava to maybe a basalt? Would it be less or more viscous? It would be less uh, viscous. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, it is. Really, that's... really runny. Super money. What about how about how about relative to water? Thicker probably, than water. Probably more. But more I'm viscous than sure. water. I'm not really sure. I mean, we just have the example of old Ingo and Yeah. But I, I also haven't seen much footage of it, so I haven't we, either. We, we can look. We can look it up. There are, there are videos of it, and compare it. Yeah, relative. <laughs> I want to know the rate of lava flow now. It says, uh, non-polymerized ionic liquids have rapid ionic transport, low eruption temperatures, 800 degrees Celsius, low viscosities, carbonatites of the lowest of any magma <clears throat> or lava in terms of viscosity. That is really, really interesting. And they're considered exotic lava flows. Yeah, those those East African rift zones are pretty, pretty impressive. And the yeah. fact that there's an active carbonatite volcano is just amazing. Um, I'd love to do a, a, a segment on that at some point soon. It does it, it does flow easily, yes. More so than even basalt. And it's at extremely low temperatures, which is quite strange because 
usually the, the higher the temperature, the less viscous the material is. But in this case, it's kind of the opposite. Um, and that's just because of its chemical composition. Guys, please give Virgil a follow on Twitter. He oftentimes tweets his own science out there, as well as retweets other scientists and their wealth of information on geoscience. It's phenomenal. I will probably get more active on my Twitter account with my own science when I get near my master thesis. <laughs> I think that'll be really great, honestly. Now, All right. do you... So we have one thing left to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's the video. <laughs> yes, show me the video. So this was created by um, TerraTech Ever... Geophysical Services um, in um, for the program Hitech Al Cup, which was funded by the EU 2020 Horizon program, and I was part of that uh, when I had an internship uh, at uh, this corporation. That's right, for um, 660 side, that's awesome. That is year. really cool. Perfect. All right. Uh, so quick heads up, this video made by TerraTech uh, Geophysical Service about all the work that was done by Hightech Alcap about the Kaiserstuhl volcano. And we saw the detailed uh, reconstruction earlier. And this all because of all that work that went into um, this, this uh, open laboratory. And there's so many interesting stuff coming out. And it's five minutes long, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. The following presentation by Hitech Alcab is a new look at geological and geophysical visualization using the last four years of scientific study of the Kaiserstuhl volcano. This natural laboratory has formed the focus of detailed geophysical measurements, mapping, and geochemical studies in order to explore deeper and better through analysis based on a mineral system approach. Let's start at the beginning, where the relentless mountain building of the Alps caused fractures to propagate towards the north, many of which have allowed deep mantle source fluids to be intruded and in places erupted. The Eiffel, Hegau, Urach, as well as other lava fields and volcanic pipes are examples of this activity, all part of the southwest German alkaline province. The most famous of these intrusions, the Kaiserstuhl, which preserves both lava flows as well as intrusive magmatic lithologies. At a district scale, the Kaiserstuhl is mainly composed of intrusive rocks and a large covered area of erupted tephrite lava flows. The volcano was active between 16 and 18 million years ago. Back then, the Rhine region looked not so different from today. To model the intrusion to depth, we started by draping the published geological map on the topography, which provided spatial and geological control. This was then integrated with the magnetic data illustrated here which, together with gravimetric and radiometric information, allowed the geological components to be presented as the following simplified units. A major finding was the recognition of the presence of two distinct units of tephrite lavas indicated in light and dark brown. Oh, that's cool. The next step was building the country rocks into which the Kaiserstuhl intruded. From the Variscan basement shown in green and bisected by the controlling faults indicated in purple, it was up along wow. these faults which fluids and magmas escaped. That is all known by geophysical da uh, data. The basement is covered by sands of the Triassic, limestone of the Jurassic, and sediments of the Paleo and Neogene. It is into these rocks that the Kaiserstuhl was intruded 18 million years ago. Using three-dimensional gravimetric and magnetic data, shown in black and red, it was possible to characterize the different intrusions and project these to a depth of three kilometers. So this is all real data you see. The coincident gravity and magnetic anomalies indicate an upended urn-shaped intrusion beneath the known sodalite Monzogabros and carbonatites. Other intrusions are the phonolites in red. Vertical pipe-like intrusions which erupt rapidly and expanded near the surface once the lithostatic load was breached. In purple, the Limburg intrusion, which contains mantle xenoliths brought to the surface from depths of 30 kilometers or more. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Hidden beneath the lavas are geophysical anomalies indicating unknown intrusive or extrusive rocks. 
These almost horn-like extremities are roughly orientated along the Tuniberg Fault and are similar to features observed at the Vulture volcano in Italy, suggesting these rocks are part of an early caldera or diatreme collapse structure. For the final part of the puzzle, we moved into the most detailed prospect scale. It is at this scale of investigation where we explore in the field. Shown are the results of an electrical IP survey which indicates in red where electrically chargeable minerals such as sulfides occur. Oh, cool. We know deep weathering is necessary to upgrade deposits of niobium and rare earths. So the place to look is where weathering is greatest. The zone cross-cut by the Tuniberg Fault shows the deepest weathering and indeed, samples collected from here reveal the most significant rare earth mineralization recorded in the Kaiserstuhl. This project has now laid the foundation for the application of a mineral system approach in the exploration of critical materials hosted in carbonatite and alkaline silicate rocks. That was really good. All right. Yeah. And you, you helped put this together? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, I just had a um, short internship at, uh, at this film. And that this is video is the result of a lot of people working together over four years, um, coming from many angles, from, from geophysics, from petrology, from mineral mineralogy, environment, together to uh, piece this puzzle together. Of, this is a really of this open story. laboratory, which is the Kaiserstuhl volcano. So this is one of many volcanoes in, in Germany and in Europe, but it is extinct yeah. and it produces carbonatites, or at least it did. No longer it's extinct. Now this particular, uh, the Kaiserstuhl, Kaiserstuhl volcano, how big were these eruptions? Were they, I mean, they were what, Strombolian in size? From what I um, understand, probably volcanic to Plinian or Subplinian. Really? I mean, you, yeah, I mean, you, you have phonolites in there, which are Fair. about 60% silica content still. Um, and so very, fairly very explosive. Um, hmm? So fairly explosive. Fairly explosive, yes. And you also see this at Old Ungulengai. It's not only a carbon type mm. volcano, you have sometimes explosive eruptions there as well. Yeah. Uh, and I also, you can also see uh, pyroclastic deposits uh, there, which indicate uh, pyroclastic flows or something like this. So it, it was a big strata volcano. It, it's not a shield volcano. No. Um, this this thing was like two, three kilometers high or something like this in, a in a size. fairly yeah. cone shape. So fairly fairly typical strata volcano shape, sounds yeah. like. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. Um, something like Mount Etna in, in this direction, not really like a cone, but still a big mountain yeah. <laughs> with many vents and, and yes, stuff like yes. this. Uh, there was another question. Do you find basaltic rocks around these gem volcanoes similar to what we see in the Pacific? So yes and no. Um, basaltic, yes, they are basaltic. They are not basalt. They're a bit uh, more alkaline, so tephrites, for example. Um, or nephilinites, alkali basalts. Um, you get those as well in ocean island basalts, uh, not necessarily in, in Hawaii, but in un, uh, other ocean islands. Uh, but you have also poolitic uh, levers in, in the Vogelsberg. Um, we saw it in the first slide. It's one of the biggest uh, volcanic centers in, in Central Europe. And, and the, the late stage of this volcanism produced uh, foliatic lava, so similar to what we see in, in Hawaii, for example. Uh, Voicey wants to know, I missed, I missed a chunk of the presentation, but how does Rhine, how does the rhine graben tectonic system work? It's supposedly alpine related, but the angle and placement seems strange. Yeah, that's a good observation, uh, Voicey, uh, because the stress field changed. Uh, it wants aligned to the to the paleo stress field, which was roughly north south, and now it turns um, north west south south east. And so now it guys... it it opened in in, in a time where compression was uh, north south, um, or south north, 
and uh, this, this was roughly in the, in the Eocene and Oligocene. There were different uh, opening events for the for the upper Weingraben, and now it transformed to a strike slip um, fault system. Yes, which also yeah, has some some um, rifting still happening due to the strike slip nature, but it's uh, very local. That's, that was probably one of my favorites because I really, I, I love structure. So I'm glad we got to talk about that in the beginning and then again. My voice, and, that, uh... that's just... <laughs> the following... I, I wasn't exact, like north, south, north, 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 east, south, south, west, west oriented drift. Oh, 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 you mean why it's uh, in this direction? Because the extension is uh, uh, 90 degrees. So extension is west, east. If that's, that's what you mean. I think so. So the next question is, what geologic feature makes them so cool by scooter? Are, are you talking about carbonatites specifically? We'll go with that. So what geologic feature makes carbonatites so cool or interesting to you? Well, the first interesting fact is, of course, um, that there were once liquid lava. Um, one of the first things you learned, you, you can't melt limestone, not at uh, surface conditions. So the idea that you have liquid uh, calcium carbonate is, is re really strange. That's one of the coolest facts, of course, yeah. next to the fact that the lava itself is really cool, <laughs> literally, <laughs> compared to, to more uh, yes. normal it's, lava. It can be down to 500 degrees C, which is really, really unusual. Some, I think there's some really highly silicic lavas that can almost be that low in temperature, but not very often. It's a very, I think it's, I, I think they're hydrous and they're usually pegmatitic if I remember correctly, but yeah. that is something I need to, to fact check. Is it? And, okay. and pegmatites are a whole nother can of yeah. rot. <laughs> I love pegmatites. Oh, I love them. Are the Kaiserstuhl intrusions associated with any carbonatite hosted or otherwise resources? Um, you mean in the mantle? Um, could be. Um, as far as I know, the carbonatite in the Kaiserstuhl is not primary carbonatite from the mantle, but uh, it's more of, a, of an evolved melt, uh, maybe a, a, an immiscibility from from an original melt or something like this. I have to, to look up the details on that. Carbonatite hosted or otherwise resources in terms of ore? Um, I think rare earth elements are one thing that's oh, yeah. from carbonatites. Um, yeah, so the carbonatite in Kaiserstuhl uh, hosts pyrochlor, uh, which is uh, neop oxide. And this was indeed mined in, in the 40s, but not anymore. It's too low grade and it's also a protected area. Not negative 500. No, not freezing. Lava doesn't freeze. <laughs> No, no, it's 500 degrees Celsius. It would be even cooler if it's <laughs> minus like 250 it, Kelvin or something it, like this. It'd be a rock. It'd, it'd just be a rock. A really <laughs> cold rock. Oh, wait, how do you get into this sort of volcanic study? Great question, Sherna. Um, well, this isn't uh, part of uh, volcanology uh, oriented field. I got into it uh, through my petrology department. Uh, which was also part of the high-tech alkali program. And it, they focus on a lot of these alkali uh, igneous rocks. They, they did work in Greenland. They do a lot of work in also Africa. Uh, and of course, all these local, local rocks because you can uh, much better um, uh, make studies on them without, yeah traveling to another countries and the whole stuff you have to deal with there. <laughs> how old, uh, how is Old Lengai similar to Kaiserstuhl anyway? It, it is not. Old Lengai is a not, uh, I say it again, it's a sodium uh, carbonate, um, uh, carbonatite volcano. Kaiserstuhl. And that makes it even more unique, doesn't it? It doesn't make, it makes it even more unique, yes. Uh, and um, yeah, it's believed that maybe these lavas separate from nephilinites, which are also very sodium rich. Uh, but the Kaiserstuhl was uh, definitely uh, calcium carbonate, carbonatite 
type of of a volcano. So pretty. Is it? Would you say that the Kaiser Stuhl volcano is more of a? I guess if there is to be a traditional type of carbonatite, a traditional type of carbonatite, fairly typical and standard for that kind of magma. Um, well, most of the carbonatite rocks we have are calcium carbonatite uh, um, so yeah, it's probably fairly typical carbonatite volcano, if if you can say that. Okay, so I kind of want to. I, I I would love to do a talk someday on Odion Lenga. I can't ever pronounce the first <laughs> part. I'm really bad, but I I do know somebody who's that is their favorite volcano. So maybe we could get them on the stream someday, or just do a nice collaborative talk on it because it is such an interesting volcano. Both it is. And, and really beautiful. It is. And it's even, I honestly like the cultural aspect of it too, because it affects the villagers nearby mm -hmm. so much. So I'd love to even talk a bit about that. It's just. Mountain, Mountain of God is, it, uh, is yes. it called, I think. I believe so. Um, and that is the, that is the location where I've mentioned before the CO2. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lake. Um, I don't know where exactly the lake is what part of the volcano the lake is from, but there's CO2 that escapes from it regularly and it can asphyxiate and uh, unfortunately kill. And it's happened to a variety of villagers and, and well, a field of goats at one point. So it's, there's a lot going on that's not just geologic that we could talk about with that one. And I'd love to have you back right. if you're ever interested.